Hi everyone, welcome to Rock Bottom Syndicate. I'm your host, Joyce Strong. Rock Bottom Syndicate is about people who have a story to tell to inspire others to consistently, persistently pursue their potential. Rock Bottom is an opportunity to learn, change course, and tell your story to help others and help yourself. Your secrets are the prison of your emotions. Ask for help, tell your story. I have Kevin Palmieri today. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm so excited to hear your story. I've heard bits of it, and thank you so much for coming and being willing to get vulnerable. I appreciate you having me back on. What is this, the third time? I've been in the studio multiple times. I feel like this is my second home. I think home. we've done 10, 12. It's, it's been a lot, yeah, but it's every time is a pleasure. Every time is a pleasure. <laughs> um, and in the past, you've been on the Totally Well Show, and we've been talking about personal development, and part of that story has mm -hmm. been you know, what you've been through. Rock bottom, as you you know know from uh, our discussions and preamble, and from um, from what I just talked about, is really the whole process of telling your story and what that's like. And so, <laughs> the floor is mine. The floor is yours. So I believe that many people have the misfortune of finding out that there is a rock bottom. Other people have it worse, where they find out that rock bottom has a basement. I was the person who found out that both of those things existed. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe looking back into your past can do one of two things. It can either create an anchor that holds you back for your entire life, mm -hmm. or it can be gasoline that you can pour into your tank and that'll take you to the next level. And that's why, that's one of my main focuses when I'm sharing my story. Because I want people to look at me and say, wow, he did it, I can too. Rather than, well, look at how lucky he is or blessed he is or how good he is, whatever it may be. So I want everybody to know that we're all starting from the same place. Mm -hmm. And we all have that history. We all have that past. So for me, my first initial rock bottom moment was when I was 25 years old. By all outside standards, I had everything that a 25-year-old man could have or, or want. Mm -hmm. I had the body of my dreams. I had the girlfriend of my dreams. I had my dream car. I had a brand new apartment. I had a six-figure income. I had great friends. So looking at that, you would think, wow, he has everything. Mm -hmm. What could possibly be wrong? I felt the same way, actually. I thought I had everything, too. And I went on about my life, and everything seemed great. It was October. So it was, I think it was about, it was four years ago, or five years ago, because mm -hmm. we're in October right now, the end of October. It was the beginning of, of October, and my girlfriend at the time broke up with me. Mm -hmm. Now, I had just gone through a bodybuilding show. Alan can attest to this, and anybody else who has ever done that. When you're at the tail end of your bodybuilding show, your prep, you are starving. You mm -hmm. are below a healthy level of fat. Mm -hmm. The only thing you're doing is going to the gym. Mm -hmm. So this was two weeks after my show. My girlfriend left me. I'll never forget, we're sitting, we sat at the kitchen table and she said, I've been feeling like this for a long time, but I didn't want to leave you because I thought you might kill yourself. And I don't, I've never told that before because that actually came to me recently. And I'll never forget that. When she left, I was sitting. She told me to write. She said, how do you feel? And I said, I feel terrible. I feel like I don't know what I'm going to do. I feel like I'm lost. I feel like I'm stuck. I feel like my bills just doubled and I don't know how I'm going to afford this. And she said, you should sit down and write. And I remember saying, no. I'm not going to write. Did she say this? I want to slow it down sure. a little bit because I'm, I'm trying to follow the sequence. So, so she she asked you if you wanted to kill yourself. She or said she, she was afraid of it. Yes, and because then, I was so low at that point in this bodybuilding prep. This is the first time I ever experienced, in my opinion, what was depression. Yeah. So was it then during that discussion that she tried to give you some support and encourage you to write? This was so. This is how she broke up with me. Basically, we okay. were sitting at the kitchen table. She yeah. said, I'm not happy. Yeah. You're a shell of this, the person that you were. You know, I don't feel fulfilled. I don't feel supported. I don't feel loved. I don't feel like you're here. Yeah. I've been feeling like this because my initial question is, okay, how do I fix this? Yeah. How long have you been feeling this way? Well, I've been feeling this way for a couple of months, yeah. but I didn't want to leave you during your bodybuilding prep because I thought you might kill yourself. So I, that was... Having the car, having the girl, having the body, having the job, having the apartment, having all the nice things blanketed the fact that I never felt good enough about myself. And this was the first time I ever had to look my demons in the eyes. 
But you, she knew, so you were sending signals without being aware. She definitely knew. Yeah. She definitely That's knew. That's fascinating. I what do you think the signals, what do you think she was picking up? The fact that I wasn't, some people live in their comfort zones. I was c cemented to my comfort zone. There was no going out of my comfort zone. Wow. There was, I didn't like going out to dinner with certain people. I didn't like meeting new people. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't do anything to get out of my comfort zone. Uh, when I got home from work, I sat on the couch and that was what I did. Like I didn't want to go explore. I didn't want to go try new things. I didn't want to do any of that. So those were signs yes. that she was picking up yes. that you weren't. Right. To me, it was normal. Yeah. To me, that was just, that was just she normal to me. She didn't see it as, she saw it as danger or red flags maybe? I think she saw it as somebody who needed not somebody that she could fix, maybe somebody that had potential. Because I always treated her well. I was always a nice person. I always meant well. Yeah. But to me, I think I've been depressed. I think I've dealt with anxiety for a long time. I just, to me, it was normal. Mm -hmm. What you practice becomes normal. Right. Regardless of if you know you're practicing it or not. Yeah. Right? So for me, the days after that were some of the hardest days in my life. After she left, she packed her stuff. She said, I'll, I'll be back for the rest. Okay. Okay, that was, that was the first time that ever happened. I ever had that adult conversation of, I'm going to come get my things mm -hmm. because we live together. So the next couple weeks, I really dove into personal development. And this was my first dip into personal development. Awesome. Yeah. Kevin, you're learning. You're gonna, it's, it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. And I'll never forget one of the nights I was laying in bed and I was thinking to myself, okay, this year is going to be different. I'm really going to make something of myself this year. And I said... God, universe, whatever it is up there, whatever this higher power is, mm -hmm. this year I'm going to have the most successful financial year of my entire life. I will make $100,000 without a college degree. I will show everybody that it doesn't matter what your level of education is. It matters what your work ethic is. I will do that this year. Mm -hmm. And I did. I ended up doing that. Now, So you're trying to buy happiness? Yes, yes. So this is what I say. Some people have the misfortune of finding out there's a rock bottom. I was at that rock bottom. And rather than building myself up, I reverted to, I just need more money. Mm -hmm. I just need more money and more things and everything's gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. Let me shield myself and not, I'm, gonna, I'm done facing these demons. I've seen too much. I don't like being insecure. I don't like being not confident. Let me just pretend I am again and let me get the material stuff back mm -hmm. and then everybody will think I am. I won't have to, I won't have to overcome that. Mm -hmm. So. The next year was the craziest year of my entire life. I traveled up and down the East Coast as a construction foreman for 10 out of 12 months. I was home wow. eight days a month. I was gone every single day except for the weekends. And I ended up making $100,000 that year. Yay, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. And nothing changed. Nothing changed. Things actually got worse yeah. somehow, even though I had everything I thought I wanted. So. The Hyperconscious Podcast is my thing now, Alan and I's thing. I'm the host of that, and that is my main purpose, my passion, my drive. That is what pulls me to do what I do every single day. I was laying in bed one night, and this thought came to me, and this is what Hyperconscious became. It doesn't matter what bed you're laying in. It doesn't matter who you're laying next to, what the house is, what car is in the garage, where this house is, what you're doing tomorrow. The only thing that matters is what's up here, because all of those things do not change this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really started getting in touch with motivation and insecurity and lack of confidence and self-esteem and anxiety and figuring out that behind every result there is a process. Mm -hmm. The problem is I never wanted to face the details of my process. I just wanted the result. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be rich and I didn't want to have to face who I was. I thought that would be enough. I thought the results of materialism would save me. And that wasn't the case. So I was already doing the podcast. This podcast had started. Mm -hmm. At that point, it was just a passion project. I, didn't even, I wasn't even working with Alan yet. I was doing it by myself, just interviewing people for fun. And I remember after I made that $100,000, and I had that thought to myself of the money didn't change anything. What, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I stopped wanting the money. I didn't care about making the money anymore. And for somebody who is on the road every single day with the only focus of making money, I lost my why power to do that. I lost my why power to drive six hours and then work eight hours, stay up all night, mm -hmm. do all that. So my overnight, my intentions changed. 
and I didn't want that life anymore. I didn't know what life I wanted yet. Mm -hmm. So as I got more into podcasting, it eventually got to the point where I couldn't do both. Alan and I had built a lot of really good relationships with people. We had great guests, mm -hmm. but my schedule was filling up and it was either work full time or podcast. Mm -hmm. And this was an internal dialogue. This was a fight that I was dealing with. I cannot start my own company. I don't know how to do that. I can't make a living out of podcasting. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. How am I going to do that? I'm going to quit my job. I made $100,000 last year. Mm -hmm. I can't go back. Mm -hmm. I can't go back. So this, this process was something I dealt with for a while. And my rock bottom basement moment, which I think was one of the best times, or the best days of my life, looking back, I was sitting on the edge of a hotel bed in a crusty room in New Jersey. And it was 5.45 in the morning. I believe it was a winter morning. Mm -hmm. We're getting ready for work. And my coworker had just woken up. He was laying in bed looking at his phone. I was sitting on the edge of the bed, my work boots on. I don't think they were tied yet. And I just describe it as I couldn't turn the noise off in my head. I don't know how to describe it any other way. It was like a scene from a movie where there's 15 TVs playing at the same time. And it's just this voice and this static and this voice and this static. You'll never be good enough. You're stuck here. If you leave here, you're going to be broke. If you leave here, people are going to think you're crazy. If you leave here, people are going to look down on you. Mm -hmm. and they're not going to understand you. You're going to be judged. You're stuck here forever. You don't have a college degree. What are you doing? What are you going to do? And in that moment, I truly thought the best thing for me would be to be dead because I could leave all of these things behind. I could leave my insecurity behind. Mm -hmm. I could leave my not-enoughness behind. I could leave this feedback from other people behind and this judgment behind, I could leave all of this behind and I wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I closed my eyes and I thought about things and I remember texting Alan and or I Snapchatted Alan. I said, hey, I'm dealing with some stuff right now and I need somebody to talk to. And he was there for me and mm -hmm. he talked me through it. And I was never at the point where I was formulating a plan. I was never there, but in my mind, I just knew that if something didn't happen, I didn't want to continue doing what I was doing. And doing what I was doing at that point was living. Mm -hmm. That was my life. So that was, looking back, that was the worst day of my entire life, but it was also the best day because that's the day that I found out that I do have a passion, I do have a purpose, I do have a gift, and that is to be the person that I needed. Not only when I was at my lowest point, but maybe earlier. Maybe earlier so I actually never got to my lowest point. Mm -hmm. I never had a lot of people to look up to when I was growing up. I never had a lot of mentors. I never had a lot of role models. So that is one of my purposes. I want people to know that no matter where you came from, no matter what environment you were raised in, no matter what influences were upon you, you can influence others in whatever way you want. You can change somebody else's environment by using yours as motivation. Mm -hmm. And the only thing holding you back, the only thing, is how hard are you willing to work? That's it, that's the only thing. If you are willing to work hard at something, you can be the best in the world. And I firmly believe that. I wanna be the best podcaster ever. That is an audacious goal. But I think I'm willing to work harder than anybody else. So I think it'll happen. Mm -hmm. I think it'll happen. So, thank you Absolutely. for sharing that. It, as you tell the story, it's, it feels like um, you've grown so much from that point, but it, Going back to that moment sitting on the bed, um, and thank God you called Alan, mm -hmm. because um, that moment sounds like it was really severe pain, and you were actually thinking about killing yourself. You were thinking about dying and taking dying by suicide um, to stop the pain. Is that true? Is that what it was? Yeah, and another thing I don't, I don't know if I've ever said this on an interview, that wasn't the first time I felt that way. Yeah. When I was, I was living in Boston with that same girlfriend who broke up with me, and we lived in the attic of this apartment, beautiful apartment, unreasonably nice, mm -hmm. in Boston, in Dorchester, Lower Mills. And I, I remember being upstairs, and I just, I didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to explain it. I felt this emptiness. It felt like something had been taken from me. Yeah. And I was home alone that day, and I remember thinking, like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I don't think living is... It doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel like anything's happening or changing. Mm -hmm. I just feel stuck. So I always advocate therapy for people because I went to therapy. Mm -hmm. I went to therapy in Boston, one of the hardest things I ever did. Walking up this, 
these creaky stairs and thinking like, oh my God, mm -hmm. what is about to happen? What questions is this lady gonna ask me? Am I gonna be able to answer them? Am I gonna cry? Yes, I did cry. Mm -hmm. But I always advocate for therapy because there's a lot of stuff in there yeah. and in here and in there for you. Yeah. And if you don't face that stuff, like I tried to face that stuff when my girlfriend left me, I tried to, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I couldn't, maybe I just, didn't try hard enough, maybe I wasn't consistent enough, maybe I didn't have a why, I didn't have the why power to sit down and say, you're gonna get over this today. Mm -hmm. But when I went to therapy, that opened up my eyes to the way my past was affecting me. So you found ways then to, with the t call to Alan, or the Snapchat to Alan, or, the, or deciding to go to therapy, to reduce the pain long enough, yeah. and then walk into it to be able to, to to reduce the pain and then um, go into the pain or embrace the pain and examine things from the past. So perhaps um, earlier in the conversation I was thinking this, um, the, the reasons why this didn't come up sooner for you. Mm. Like by the time it really started to surface, you were in your mid-20s. Yeah. I was a great actor. Yeah. That's so the problem. I wonder how far back these feelings really started, like what were some of the obstacles that were too scary for you to? I think growing, I, so I grew up without a father and I don't think I ever handled that correctly because I never, again, what you deal with on a daily basis becomes normal to you. Is there a correct way to handle something like that? I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I think I ran from it. I, I internalized the anger and went to a dark place when I thought about that. Like I. One time I found out that he might have cancer. Like mm -hmm. That was like the, I, in a roundabout way, somebody said, oh, I, I heard your dad might have cancer. And I said, good, I don't care. Mm. Like I, I literally said, I'll be at the cemetery to piss on his grave is what I said. Mm. I regret that because again, I, I was an angry kid. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't, I also didn't have the life experience to understand that this man may not have wanted a son. He may not have been ready for a child. He was dealing with his own things. Mm -hmm. Now, should he have taken extreme ownership and stepped up? Yes, and he should have he should have handled the stuff that he should have. But I think that being able to forgive him has allowed me to connect to the fact that although I never had a man to follow, I will be a man to follow. That is one of my main things. Alan and I say that all the time. I'm playing to be the best podcaster, the best speaker, and the best coach. But more than that, if I don't accomplish any of those things, I want to be the best man. Mm -hmm. The best man I can be, the best father, the best husband, the best friend, all of that. That is what I'm playing for. I want to leave the room and people to say, wow, what a, what a great guy. Like, what a great guy he was. Mm -hmm. Even though he went through all of this, I can do that too. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm playing for. I think you said before um, that you want to be the person that... Had, had... I want to be the person that I needed when I was at my lowest point. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And it, that requires a certain, certain qualities. That yeah. requires being non-judgmental. That requires being a good listener. Yeah. Because if somebody's afraid you're going to judge them, they're not going to be forthcoming with their, their feelings. Yeah. So it's, that's one of the things that I admire most about Alan is that I can talk to him about anything. Mm -hmm. And we have had some t tough, tough, dark conversations where we're sitting in the car crying mm -hmm. because we're talking about a certain thing. Yeah. But I've never once left that worried about the way he th thought of me or the way he looked at me or if he judged me. It's always, we always meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that if you are dealing with anything, maybe you're at your rock bottom moment, maybe you're climbing out of your rock bottom moment, mm -hmm. find somebody that you trust mm -hmm. that you can be vulnerable with. We've mm -hmm. talked about vulnerability in the past many times, and I think that is one of the keys to healing. Mm -hmm. If you don't tell your full story, how do you expect to heal from it? Uh, from what I've learned from um, Dr. Goulston and other people is it's important to get into that part of your brain that can make rational decisions mm -hmm. and out of the, the fight or flight piece. And um, just the act of having close people that you can trust and just not to solve it, but just to share it is a critical part. Would you agree with that? I would, I would definitely agree. And I think it's almost like you look at your past as such a negative thing that you stick it in your closet and you don't ever want to look at it again. Yeah. But the problem is you're carrying that closet with you everywhere you go. Yeah. Versus when you make it part of your message, not only do you own it, not only do you lean into it, but you're kind of grateful it happened. Mm -hmm. Because if it didn't happen, 
If I didn't want to kill myself, I would still be working at that company. I wouldn't be here right now. I would be in New Jersey crawling through a basement, <laughs> flicking dead mice out of the way so I could get to the corner. <laughs> but for, it's, it's hard to catch somebody that's in that rock bottom and say, look, I know this sucks. I know this sucks. Yeah. But eventually you will look back and be grateful that this happened yeah. because this is going to give you a drive. This is going to give you ambition. This is going to give you clarity. This is going to give you a purpose that you never had before. Yeah. But it's easy, hindsight's twenty twenty. When you're going through it, that's when it's really hard. Um, Mike Moosebarger, um, who I've interviewed before and has been on this show, said if he, ha he says embrace the pain. Mm. Um, so in his life, he's had tragedy, and he's learned that it's actually um, important to embrace it and understand it. What I wonder about for him, for you, for Alan, for others, for me, um, how much shame has played a part or uh, in not coming out sooner mm. <laughs> with your story to be able to talk about it earlier in your life. Was there shame involved? Yeah. So or embarrassment. This or, is one yeah. of the, the real moments of the dark side of having suicidal thoughts. Obviously, it's all dark. But when the first time I ever had a suicidal thought is when I was in that attic apartment mm -hmm. in Boston. And I literally thought to myself, you have never quit tattooed on your arm. Mm -hmm. You're going to let people come in here. And you already had that. Yes. Yes. I've had oh. this since I was 16. Oh. My mom took me to get this. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Yes. I've had, this is, this has been on me for a long time. Yeah. And it's become part of my identity, which I think is a great thing. Yeah. I took. But you reapplied it because right? it meant something right? else right? before. Right. But I didn't want the paramedics to come find me laying on the floor dead yeah. with a never quit tattoo. Like. You're the never quit kid. Are you going to quit or oh, are you wow. going to keep going? Yeah. So in that moment, I, that was probably a pride thing. I, I didn't want people to see me like, oh, he's a liar. Look what he has on his arm. <laughs> he couldn't handle it. But it's, yeah, it's, like I said, it's a lot easier to look back now and be grateful for it. Yeah. But I just want people to know that no matter where their rock bottom is, the peak of their mountain is still out there too. It's just maybe it's a different climb for you. you got to take a different route. It's mm -hmm. a longer route. Mm -hmm. the back route, whatever it is, but it's out there. It's just a matter of whether or not you want to climb. And on the, the um, logo design that I came up with for this show has the infinity symbol. And the way I thought about it was, um, and the more people I talk to, I'm like, everyone has these moments. This right. is part of life. And it, if you're young, if you're still, you know, very young or even my age, you can, you, when you encounter something that's never happened to you before, um, just at a different phase of your life, it can feel, it's just out of context, it can, and it can feel like a forever thing. Um, but if you keep that infinity symbol, that there's something, we're about to go on the upswing, um, that this is a message, this is drawing attention to, uh, uh, getting you to pay attention to something that you need to pay attention to, to help you to grow. Yeah, I think it becomes a forever thing if you let it. Yeah. It, the, the way you look at your past becomes your future story. And right now, this, this suicide thing will be a forever thing for me. Every time I talk about it, yeah. it's going to be there. Yeah. But instead of it being a scab that I'm picking on, yeah. it's a tattoo now that I can look at and say, this is what made the change for me. Yeah. And this is what could make the change for you. Maybe me sharing this story will inspire somebody who went through something similar to say, wow, all of that stuff that I went through that I'm letting hold me back, and I've let it hold me back for so long, all of that stuff can actually be the inspiration and the motivation to get me to help other people. Maybe me sharing my story will help other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe me owning my past will help other people. Mm -hmm. But you have to want to own it for yourself first. And that's the hardest part. Yeah. That's the hardest part. It's easy when you have a podcast and you get to talk about it all the time. Yeah. But for somebody who hasn't, you have to own it yourself. Do you think it could happen again? It's funny you say that. It's funny you say that. My girlfriend said that to me the other day. Promise me, promise me if you ever get to that point again, you'll tell me. And I said, I can promise you that'll never happen again. Do I know that it'll never happen again? No, mm -hmm. I don't. I wish I did. I wish I did. But I'm the happiest, most fulfilled version of myself I've ever been. Mm -hmm. And I don't plan on that happening again, but I didn't plan on it happening the first time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah. I wish I could kick something philosophical and, <laughs> and give you a good quote. I don't plan on letting it happen to me. My, my word is resilient. Mm -hmm. I plan on conquering the world. I plan on changing the world. I plan on 
teaching countless people that they can have whatever life they're willing to work for. Let me ask it a little different way. Sure. So I'm convinced that you, you'll probably not get suicidal again, that that won't be an option. But rock bottom can have many different um, uh, appearances or, you know, just turn up in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I know, because I'm older, <laughs> that stuff keeps happening. In a couple of years, 30, what are you, 33, 34? Yeah, 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 close, yeah. We're still like dating age, right? right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but you're not single, so. Right, that's true. <laughs> that Taryn would cut that part. Yeah. <laughs> so, so could it show up for you in another way? Like some way that you just don't anticipate now because you have so much life in front of you. Um, could it happen again? I think it could. Find? Yeah. I think if, uh, what did I just say? I'm the most fulfilled, happy version of myself I've ever been. What if I lost it all? What if I lost the podcast? What if I lost my business partner? What if I lost my girlfriend? What if I lost my best friend? What if I lost my purpose? What if I lost my passion? It could. Mm -hmm. It could, but that's... And maybe in this moment, I will lock this in as the extra motivation to make sure that for the longest time, I only cared about material things. Mm -hmm. I left all of that back, or I left all of that behind so I could become the most competent, proud version of myself. Mm -hmm. And that's what, it's crazy. I left all of the results and I became the person I wanted to be and now the results are coming back in different ways. Mm -hmm. I have to lock that in and realize the only reason you feel as happy, as fulfilled, as proud as you do is because you're doing the work. I think if the work stops, the results will stop. Mm -hmm. And when the results stop, that could be bad. Mm -hmm. But I don't ever plan on stopping. Mm -hmm. So I think if it happens, it'll be my own doing. It'll be my own fault. I know that sounds harsh, but I have to take full ownership for that. And I will also have more resources and better resources to seek help when necessary. Mm -hmm. Because that's a thing for sure. Yeah. Well, that, and I'm glad that you came to that because I, I, I think, well, here's, here's a, another way to, to say it. It's not if the glass breaks, it's when. Mm. Mm. I think it, it breaks differently though. And that's the thing too. Yeah. What, what, in high school, when you go to high school and a girl breaks your heart, it's the end of the world. You don't want to go to school. Yeah. I can't be seen. I don't want people to know this girl broke up with me. Now it's different. So you have to make sure that you're flexing that emotional muscle. I pr pretended to be resilient back when I was 20, yeah. 25. I was pretending to be resilient. I didn't, this looked cool. This looked cool. Now this is what I live. So I think yeah. as your emotional muscle evolves, the circumstances don't affect you nearly as much. And again, maybe this is the tough guy way of saying, I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't know. But I don't plan on it happening because I have been put in so many situations where I could have quit, not life, but I could have quit that journey, yeah. and I keep showing up. Every day, I keep showing up. If or when the glass breaks, you'll be, you have more tools in your toolbox. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We're about out of time. It goes by so fast. <laughs> it goes by so fast. Um, so ending a little bit abruptly, but I really appreciate your sharing and being so vulnerable, telling your story, and I know it will help other people to hear that, hear of your struggle and how you dealt with it and... Um, just leveled up and uh, and the future looks really bright. I appreciate you yeah. giving me an opportunity to be on your platform and tell my story. I think it's it's the most empowering thing when you take your past and you use it for your future and I just want more people to be able to do that and know it's it's not only possible but it feels good too. Nothing um, better than exchange of the heart. Right. Yeah. I'm all about it. Yeah. Well, thank you Kevin. You're very welcome. Yeah.